Listen, the title of this series that we're in is Live Generously. The title of this message in this series is Don't Miss the Point. Don't miss the point. The term miss the point refers to not understanding something correctly or what is important about what we're talking about. So many times you'll be in discussions with people and you'll hear them say, man, you missed the whole point. I don't know how many times I've talked to staff or people and they thought I meant something. I said, wait a minute, you missed the point. That wasn't what my point was. My point was something else. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And so we missed the point. And one reason people fail to live generously is that they miss the point completely about what God's trying to do. They get their eyes on the wrong things at times. They may not even be bad things, but, they, but are they the best things to get focused on? Are they the things that reflect the heart of God? So many of us get focused even on good things, but, but our focus needs to be more on God's things. See, too many of us are trying to get God to bless our lives instead of us doing what God blesses in our lives. And there's a big difference. Today, the gospel that's being preached all over America, maybe even the world, is a gospel that says it's all about you. It's about your happiness, your, your peace, your joy. And that's not the gospel. The gospel means when you preach the true gospel, it's all about Jesus in you. Allowing him to mold you into his image. But what we want is we want a God to be molded in our image. And that's where people, excuse me, miss it. And it's not about you, it's about God in you. It's about God working in you and through you. And so if a man wants to serve his wife, for example, and what she really wants for him to do is just simply take out the trash when it's full. Not hard. But instead of doing that, he brings her flowers and leaves her nice notes. And she looks at him and says, those are nice, but you missed the point. Really, all I want you to do is take out the trash when it's full. But he could say, but honey, I, I left you flowers. I left you nice notes. I get it, but that's not what I really wanted. Those are nice, but you missed the point. If an employer tells an employee to do a specific task, but the employee doesn't do it, then they've missed the whole point, right? But they say, hey, I didn't do it. Why didn't you do what I asked you to do? Well, because I'm better at this other stuff. Yeah, but I didn't ask you to do the other stuff. I asked you to do this task. Well, they've missed the point. Because they think they're good at something else, they can ignore the boss on this one. People miss the point all the time. And we miss the point, all of us do at times, about God and the scriptures. And so it's no different when it comes to God. People say, I want to do something great for God. And someone comes to them in need or asks them for help, and they don't help. Then that person has missed the point. Because doing something great doesn't mean everyone is going to like you or know you. People have come to me over the years that I've done this and say, preacher, I just want to do something great for God. And I said, we need ushers. Oh, no, no, no. I want to do something great. We need greeters. No, no, you don't understand. I want to do something great for God. Hey, we need children's workers. We need people in our nursery. No, you don't understand. I want to do something great for God. Can I tell you something? Doing something great for God, majority of the time, probably 95 to 98% of your life, is just simply living your life for him. It's an ordinary daily life that I live for God. And you know what? People that want to do great things for God, usually they do nothing for God because they're waiting for this great assignment. But you never know when you door greet and you greet somebody that walks in the door that doesn't feel like they fit here or that the church wouldn't accept them and you greet them and you say, hey, welcome, we're glad you're here. You don't know, that could change a whole life. That could be something great for them because now they come in, they feel welcome, they hear the message, God deals with their heart, they get born again. Do you not think that's great? And usually when people say they want to do something great for God, here's what they want to do. They just want to be popular. They want to be looked to. In this state, you know, when I've come here, so many people have come to me that come to our church and say, I'm a pastor. And I'm like, well, okay, whatever. I don't even introduce myself as that most of the time. Unless I'm dealing with something very serious. 
But if I call somebody, I'm just Steve. That's my name. That's what my mom called me, my dad. Pastor's what I do. Pastor's what God's called me to do. And people are so caught up with titles. I'm a pastor. They're not here, you're not. We don't even know you. Well, what can I do? Serve. Oh, yeah, but I'm better than that. I said, okay. Well, you're too good for God then because you're all about titles. You've missed the whole point of what serving is. Years ago, God told me, if I wouldn't serve him from down here, ushering and what I did for the church, I could never serve him from up here. And people who wanna do something great for God, they need to realize, and we all need to realize, doing something for great for God is just simply living a life, doing normal daily activities. You know, teaching your kids as you go. My wife years ago went through the bank, and the bank teller gave her an extra $20, and she stopped and counted it, And she told my daughter, she said, man, the bank gave me an extra 20 bucks. Some Christians would have said, God, just bless me. (laughs) That's the way they think, which is so wrong. Your heart's wrong. So my wife said, oh, man, she didn't feel like it. But she said, Kristen, I got to go back around. We got to go sit in line. She was, you know, going through the drive-thru. So she had to go sit in line between three or four cars, behind three or four more cars, waiting just to give the 20 bucks back. But when she did, the teller said, thank you so much. Because you know what? You may think it's a blessing of God, but someone's going to have to pay that 20 bucks. When the teller comes up short in her drawer, she's going to be like, oh my gosh, what happened? And someone took it thinking, stealing. So in our normal daily lives, my wife taught my daughter, we don't take anything that's not ours. Nothing. See, most of the time living for God is not spectacular or supernatural. It's just living your life daily, trying to do the right things, learning to forgive when you've been harmed, learning to receive forgiveness when you've messed up, learning to repent quickly when you've messed up. You know, that's, that's living your life. It's not, it's not rocket science. But most people think something doing great for God is being popular. And if popularity was the key, If influence was the key, then why are all the Hollywood people and the politicians so jacked up? They're messed up people. But if power and popularity did it all, but that's what people seek. And let me help you out with something else too. People think, well, why does God bless people like Bill Gates and Soros and all these weird, weird people? And you know what? Who said God was blessing them? See, we think the same way the Pharisees thought in the, in the, in the Bible or the, the people there that, that if you were blessed or you were rich, so it was God blessing you. But folks, let me tell you something, the difference between them and us, why we should never compare ourselves. If you're a believer purposing to serve God, even though we all make mistakes, we all sin and come short of the glory of God, but we purpose to serve him, then the enemy resists you. There's an enemy out there called the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he resists your life. He doesn't want you to prosper. But to the world, he doesn't care what they make. He doesn't care what they have because he knows they're going to use it to work his kingdom, not God's kingdom. See, we got to get biblically knowledgeable. Even climate change that you hear so much about, it's propaganda. There are a ton of scientists that don't believe in any of it, but you never hear them. You know why? Because the media won't let you. But as a Christian, what are we to believe? If you believe in climate change, one of the main components of climate change is human beings' carbon footprint on this earth. And here's what they say. We're ruining the earth because there's too many people. Did God say that? No. No. God said, be fruitful and multiply. It'd have been different if Genesis 1, God had said, be fru- in Genesis 2, be fruitful and multiply, but when you get to 7 billion, that's too many. You gotta stop. So no more sex. Yeah, everybody's laughing like, what? What you talking about, Willis? But he didn't say that. God's word's eternal. He said, be fruitful, multiply. If there was 10 billion people on the earth, we still wouldn't be ruining the earth. If there was 20 billion, we still wouldn't be ruining the earth. We think God made the earth too small for people? But here's what these people are. They're so ungodly. 
that they worshiped the creation out of Romans 1. He said they, they thought themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they worshiped the creation over the creator who is blessed forever, amen. And when you worship God's creation, you, get, you're, you're, you miss the point and you get focused and you think, the, that, you think that the um, we were made for the earth instead of the earth made for us. And the earth was made for us, it's not the other way around. So when you're a creation worshiper, you can believe in that junk. But when you're a creative, when you're a creator worshiper, you believe in what God says. Now, I don't think we should pollute our waters or all that. I don't believe in all that, but I, I don't believe in all this stuff. And, 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 and our carbon footprint is ruining what? The creation they're worshiping. That's why when people say Mother Earth, I say, my mama's name is Phyllis. And I only got one, and it ain't this earth. Because they're worshiping the creation. Animal activists that are always going out there crazy, they just missed the whole point. They, they, it becomes their religion. Environmentalists, it's their religion. It's their faith. And we should have enough faith in God to say, listen, let's just keep being fruitful and multiply. Why? Because God said it, and it's for eternity. It'll never stop. Well, God knows he doesn't want you to have more than 2.5 kids. No, God doesn't care. God wants your quiver full. That means you can have about seven and be okay. So... When the women say that the shop is closed, you can look at her men and say, but baby, we have more for, we need to fill our quiver. <laughs> Let me know how that goes, but just, <laughs> just send me a note. But serving God most of the time, guys, is just living your life in a godly way. And when we blow it, we repent. So are we really serving God if we aren't purposing to do what he says? John 15, 10 says, when you obey my commandments, Jesus' words, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. How do we know we love God? By just doing what he asks. But pastor, what if I blow it? Then you blow it. Then we repent, then we get up and start again. Thank God for repentance. Thank God for forgiveness. Listen to Matthew 25, Verses 31 through 45, and I'll read this. This is the words of Jesus, not Steve, not Legacy Church. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left, so you wanna be on the right side of things. Some would say, what did he mean by that? Some of you are slow, but you're worth waiting on. Go ahead, El. <laughs> then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink, I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left. Progressive left. There's no such thing as a liberal Christian. That's fallacy. That's not real. No such monster in all of the kingdom of God. People tell me that. I'm a liberal Christian. No such thing. What you are is deceived. And I'm not saying Democrat, Republican. I think they're all terrible. They're all ruining this country. So you can't label me that way because I'm way too conservative to be a Republican and I'm way too smart to be a Democrat. And if you don't like it, I don't care anymore, guys. I'm 61 years old. What do I care? 
I've been ragged, criticized, cussed at, threatened, shot at by the best. But he said, if you're on the left. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, I'm having some fun, by the way. He says, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we see, ever see? They called him Lord. When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Folks, what we're talking about in this series is living generously with those cards that I held up a little bit ago. We're just talking about doing kind acts. If we want to reach our city, change lives, let's just do something kind. Let them know God loves them. We'll sow seed in their lives. We may, we may not reap it here, but hopefully the kingdom reaps it someday. But we're to sow seeds constantly. Just like a farmer sows seeds, we're sowing seeds. And you buy the person behind you a cup of coffee, and you tell the manager of the person, say, I'm gonna buy their coffee. Please give them this card, though. And then they get the card, and it just says, not we get glorified, God gets glorified. God loves you. I just want you to know that. It's all about learning to live generously because we're not generous naturally. We tend to be very selfish naturally. We tend to be about us naturally. So we have to learn God's, way, God's ways. And folks, we can't be afraid to talk about anything in the church. And so God wants to help us. We see people waiting for the return of the Son of God, but many have missed the point on what it means to serve God. It's not getting all the accolades and the popularity. In fact, I can tell you this, being popular is not fun. I mean, everywhere you go, someone knows you or you know somebody, you always gotta act nice. And if you're not a nice person, that's a task. Now for me, I'm, I just tend to be friendly. It's my nature. But I know some preachers that aren't friendly. They're just flat out me. Like, you don't go out, right? You don't let anybody see you. Like, you don't talk to nobody, right? Just, just preach. But God will separate, he said, his obedient followers from the pretenders and the unbelievers. And we demonstrate what we believe by the way we act. That's what we believe by the way we do. We are called to reach the lost. We are asked to let our good works shine for everyone to see. Why? That our Father in heaven would be glorified. God is desiring that we all live a generous life. And what we do for others demonstrates what we truly believe about Jesus' words to us. If you refuse to live a generous life, you might be a goat. And God says, examine your own heart. He told me to feed the sheep, but not the goats. So what do you do to the goats, preacher? We milk them for everything we can get out of them. You say, what? Oh, yeah. And because we know they won't be here long because goats don't stay very long. The problem with sheep and goats, though, is they graze in the same pasture, and sometimes they're a little hard to pick out. So you don't want to be a goat. What do goats do? They eat anything. They say anything. They pop off any way they want. They'll butt you in the backside if you turn your back to them. They're just, they're just, they're just naughty. There you go. <laughs> Sheep tend to be just grazers, just want protected, just want to be part of the group. But listen to the shepherd. And we have a great chief shepherd, Jesus, that we should all practice listening to. <clears throat> So God used sheep and goats to picture the division between believers and unbelievers. Again, the problem is they all graze together. This means there are people in our midst who look and act like sheep, but are missing the point. See, you can be doing good things and not have the heart of God. 
People say, well, I, I do this and I do that. Yeah, but does it build the kingdom or does it build your kingdom? You can live a good life, but if you fail to be salt and light to the world around you because we were so busy with our own life and we missed the broken and the hurting people that were all around us, then maybe we have missed the point. And there are people everywhere that just need God or need to know God loves them. We miss the point by being salt and light. Being salt means we call out evil when we see evil. But today, the Christian world doesn't like to be pushed in that situation. We freak out. Who is supposed to tell our leaders they're wrong if it's not the kingdom? We have a governor who I call the wicked witch of the north that people voted back in. She is a worshiper of Baal. You say, well, how do you know that? Because Baal worshipers always want to kill babies. Go read the Old Testament. God killed the prophets of Baal. But that spirit has rose up again in our state. When, when we have a governor that says, I want abortion tourism in New Mexico. Murder tourism. And that they're going to take your tax dollars and pay for those abortions. And even maybe put people up in a hotel for a day. With our tax dollars. Because Texas has basically outlawed it. So she's building a facility in Las Cruces. Thank God for Clovis, Hobbs, Portales. They have passed ordinances that will basically keep abortion clinics out of their towns. Thank God. But who's going to call her out? Now she wants to take away your guns. She wants the bad guys to have guns because they're not going to register their guns. There's no criminal going to walk in and say, here you go, officer, here's my guns. Destroy them. All she's trying to do is make our country and our state weaker. And yet we just sit back. We should be calling our legislatures and really going after them hard. You vote for this junk, we're done with you. We're going to make sure, we're going to do everything we can. But here's the problem. Democrats even have guns. And so what do they want to do? They want to take away our guns so the bad guys can have all the guns. Then they're going to say, you got to keep them locked up. Well, if I keep them locked up and a bad guy comes in my house, how am I going to shoot them? How am I going to defend myself? Oh, hold up, bad guy. Let me go to my safe. And I'm not even a mime. Are you going to wait? Okay, sir, I'll wait for you. Hurry up. Go. go get your weapon out of your safe. Go do it. They're stupid. It's ignorance gone deceived. These people are imbeciles. The governor is a reprobate. That means she has no thought of God at all. None. She's deplorable. And me, as a Christian, I want to hang on to my guns and religion. Just so they know. But see, we don't want to be salt, because salt speaks out. Have you ever been to a place that's real humid? I've, I've gone to people places in, that's real humid, and they'll say, what are these crackers in the salt shaker? Anybody ever wondered that? Some of you are like, what are they in there for? I've seen that. Because where it's real humid, if they don't put salt to absorb the moisture, that salt gets clumpy and has no taste. Now here we don't have to do it, because we live in a dry climate. If you saw crackers in here, you'd think there's something wrong, like I mean, there's a disease in here or something. Don't eat that salt. And so we got to be salty. Salty means we stand up for righteousness. We don't put up with stuff. And folks, just so everybody knows, we get a history lesson here. The Second Amendment, the gun provision in the Second Amendment that we have a right to bear arms, wasn't so much so we could protect ourselves at our home. It was to protect ourselves from the tyranny of this government that we're seeing that is out of control. That's what it was for. That we take up arms one day and say, oh no, we're going to reset this whole thing and get back to the Constitution. This governor violated all of our constitutional rights in the lockdowns. Every one of them. Now they say the death toll in 2022 is higher than 2021. 
They say the suicide rate is epic proportions. Why? Because of what they did. Why are people running out of blue states and running to red states? Here's what they're saying. I read a whole article on it. Here's what they're saying. We're safer in the red states than the blue. The blue states' crime rate is too much, and we have one of the highest crime rates. We're 51st in education. I think they put us behind Puerto Rico. It's not even a state. <laughs> and you can say, well, and then they can talk about, we're going to put more money in it. We fund our school system here more than almost anybody in the country. It's not about money. It's about leadership. What we need to do is fire the superintendent and fire most of these principals, and we get people in there that believe in, in right and wrong. But see, we don't want to stand up because church is so, we just want to be liked. I just want to do something great and everybody love me. If you're a leader, somebody's not going to like you. The problem with some of the leaders today, they all want to be liked. I don't want anybody saying things bad about me. Well, then don't be a leader. You can't please everybody. I can't please everybody in this room or watching online. I know that. So what do we do? We just keep moving forward the way God wants us to. The Pharisees are a great example of people missing the point. Listen to Matthew chapter 23, and I'll go quickly now. Verses 20, uh, chapter 23, verses 23 and 24. This is for all the people that talk about tithing. It's not in the New Testament. These are the words of Jesus himself. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe. What's it say? Oh, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. In other words, you can tithe, guys, but we got to love people. We got to be kind to them. We got to be generous. And there's people you don't like. I get it. People that rub us wrong, but we still are called to be kind. People come to the church and say, I won't come to church because that person treated me wrong. The reason you're in church and the reason God has such a diversity, the reason he's got grannies serving against guys that used to be in gangs and the grannies love them. They're so nice. They came to my house and fixed them. And I, they just love, where else do you see that? You don't see grannies out eating lunch with their ex-gang guys most of the time. But the house of God was created so God could put every walk of life together so that we could grow and learn. So if someone in the church said something you didn't like or is mistreating you, then you got to learn to overcome that. Not run and whine about it. Well, they go to church. They should be perfect. Name one perfect person in this church. Go ahead. Nobody. Unless Jesus is here, and if he's here, I want to I want to see you, Lord. Because he can stand up and say, I was perfect, Steve. None of us are perfect. That's why we're part of a church, so you can grow, you can learn to get over that stuff, so you can reach the world in a better way. So when the world offends you, you're not so offended. You're just like, nope, that's the world, that's why they do. But I'm still gonna do good to them because God wants their life. He wants their heart. And so what matters to God then? People. A faithful life is a generous life. The more generous we become with all of life's gifts, the more full lives we will all live. If you want to be successful in life, watch successful people. The problem with today is, in our country, we have made success a dirty word. And it's called covetousness. It's the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's spouse, your neighbor's horse, your neighbor's donkey, his servants, male servants, you know, female servants. You, you, in other words, you don't want what anybody else has. So I, I, there's a lot of things I want in life, but, but I don't look at somebody and say, I wish I had what they had. I'm just happy they have what they have. I don't care. God will give me what I get, what I have. He'll give me what I can handle or what he can trust me with. And so I don't care. People say, well, they make too much money. That is not for you to decide unless you're going to deal with a covetous heart. Well, what's too much? I don't know. What's too much for you? I'd like to win the lottery at $100 million. Some would say, well, that's too much for you. No, I can handle it. 
And I would have it forever. Why? Because I know how to handle money. Some people, it doesn't matter what you make, you'll still be in debt because you spend everything. You tithe 10, you save 10, and you do what you want with the 80. That's how we should live. What we do is we spend 120% and the 20% we don't have. And that's what creates debt. And then that's what gets our focus off. We miss the point and we say we can't honor God because of it. So we should look at successful people. And what you'll find about all successful people, they work their tails off. They work hard. They work a lot. Today in our country, if you work 40 hours, you're like, I work 40 hours. I'm so tired. Like, really? If you did it God's way, you'd work from sun up to sundown. Well, take that one. Like, what? How many hours is that? I don't know, 60? <laughs> Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So when you're doing these kind acts, living generously out in the public, you're gonna be refreshed by God himself. See, we become richer by being generous. The world teaches that, it, that we should hold on to so much as much as possible, but God blesses those who give freely of their possessions, their time, their energy, their intelligence. And when we give, God supplies us with more so we can give more. So what do we receive from God when we are generous? We receive freedom from enslavement to our possessions. We receive the joy of helping others. We receive God's approval. There's a principle that giving, good giving is good living. Why aren't people as a whole more generous? And here's where I want to get to, and I'll begin to close. So many people today in our world, especially in New Mexico, live with a scarcity mentality. A scarcity mentality believes that life only has so much. It believes life only has so much time, so much money, so much intelligence, so much of whatever resource you can name. So if I give, I will not have. Or if I give, I'll have less. And so we live in a state where the two basic spirits that run the state are poverty and victim mentality. And you want to add the third one, witchcraft. Even our name, Land of Enchantment, is witchcraft. And so where you have witchcraft, you have poverty. You have the victim mentality, I'm entitled. So many people today in our world that are, call themselves Christians believe they're entitled to heaven. You only get to heaven on God's terms, not yours. And God has a way for us to get there. But you don't get to pick the way, he chose the way. And so we have this scarcity mentality that we're afraid that, that, that men will run out of resources, that God only has so much. God didn't make the earth too small. He could prosper every one of us and still have stuff left over. But what does he say he'll prosper you with? Your needs being met. Most people get upset when their wants aren't met. We forget and we get our focus on the wrong things. We miss the point. So scarcity mentality or mindset is when we believe resources are limited and it causes us to be hyper fixated or fixation. When we become fully engaged in something that they can't think of anything else. When we get so fixated on certain things we can't think of anything else, that's a byproduct of scarcity mentality or mindset. You also have short-term coping. Instead of long-term problem solving, you just want to sweep things under the rug. rug uh, under the rug. You, want to, you want to just hide things. You want to dismiss them. You don't want to deal with them. We just don't want to deal with them because we don't want them fixed. We just, we just don't want to talk about them. That's the problem with this mindset. The other one, it increases stress and jealousy. And if you don't know, jealousy is one of the number one things for theft, killing, murder, all those things that are bad. Jealousy is a part of it. It's an awful spirit. But it increases that. So we get so stressed out, then we get jealous of what others have. And we think, well, there's not enough. No, we need to understand there's more than enough. There's more than enough. And when we think this way, we will think wrong. God has an abundance of provision for all of us if we'll just do what he says. And how do you defeat this type of thinking? We must renew our minds and believe that God sent Jesus and Jesus said this in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. 
God has enough for all of us if we choose to believe him. But if you have that mindset, you need to ask God to deliver you from that. And the way you get delivered is by start acting differently. Do something for somebody else. Honor the God and his kingdom. Bless the house of God. Because the abundant mindset is when you believe there are plenty of resources for everyone. And then you practice gratitude and purpose to begin to give, to tithe, and to live generously. And I'm not talking about just with your money. I'm talking about with your words, with your actions. The soft answer turns away wrath. But sometimes we need to talk a little quieter, not like, hi, how you doing? But not like, hey! Not like, like some of you jumped. <laughs> but when we're dealing with something, a soft answer turns away wrath. We need to practice living a generous life. And then God said the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. But we can all help someone else by doing intentional acts of kindness and generosity. So if, you, if you're here, go by guest services booth in the middle of the foyer, get some of these cards and do some kind acts and people will know that God loves them. And a lot of people just need to know that God loves them. Most people that, and that are lost, they think God hates them and the whole time God loves them but they just need to be told. By the foolishness of preaching shall men be saved. That's how it works. We share our life. We live ordinary Christian lives, but we have a supernatural God that can help us. And when people look at our lives and say, man, when things go wrong for you guys, handle it so differently than everybody else. Yeah, because we have a God that's more than enough. And that should deal with the scarcity mentality or mindset and give us an abundant mindset where God can truly bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for the folks in Tupencare that are now part of our family. I thank you for blessing Pastor Tammy and, and, and Pastor Eddie and their team, Lorenzo, and, and their leaders. We thank you, God, for adding to this house daily those that would be saved because that's your heart. Father, as we go forth today, may we be delivered from this scarcity mindset, this, this thinking that is just so wrong. That somehow there's not enough resources, that you made this earth too small, which is not true. That's the deception of the world. That's what the world wants us to think. Because if we think that way, we won't think that, God, you're a big God. And you actually are the creator. And that's the one, you're the one we should serve and honor, not the creation. You're the only one blessed forever, not this world. So teach us your ways, oh God, that we might know you and know your ways. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed, whether you're online or sitting in here, and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I want to get my life right today. Preacher, would you pray with me? I've never really given God my life. I believe he exists, but I've never submitted my will to his and so how do you do that? By believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you give God permission to your life to lead and direct, to help you in all aspects of your life. He'll never condemn you nor forsake you, but you have to trust that. You do it by faith, believing that he's real. So if you're here today and you're in any one of those two spiritual conditions, you say, preacher, would you pray with me? Right where you see it, I'm asking you to do one simple thing, and I want you to do it without any hesitation. You just honor God here and say, God, I want you in my life. God, I need you to forgive me. I've walked away, but I'm ready to come home. If that's you in Jesus' name, right where you see it, all of his place, in the powerful name of Jesus, would you right there at your seat, and I'm gonna pray with you at your seat, would you just lift your hand now and say, preacher, include me in your prayer. God bless you, God bless you, thank you so much. God bless you, 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 God bless you guys. God bless you over here, thank you so much. We're all gonna pray together, but I want you to lift your hand. You say, why? Because I want you to confess. This is a form of confession. The Bible says if we confess Jesus before man, he'll confess us before our Father. Just you're lifting your hand as a form of confession, and it's saying, I don't care what anybody else thinks, I want God in my life. The other thing is, I just wanna know who I'm praying for. God bless you, thank you that hand. I'm going to look across the top one last time. Anybody? Thank you. God bless 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 you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. As I look across the top some more, anybody else? 
Anybody else say, yes, pray for me. Thank you, God bless you. As I look across the bottom, say, God bless you, thank you. Who else wants to join these folks? We're all gonna pray together. But you need to acknowledge I want God in my life. Thank you so much, God bless you. Thank you, I saw that hand. Father, in Jesus' name, you saw all those hands. There's so many people, thank you so much. People changing their lives today. They're learning to live generously by giving you their life and saying, okay, God, here we go. Teach me your ways. I'll, I'll learn to trust you. I'll renew my mind and my thinking to think the way you think because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher and better than any of our ways. Bless each one, Lord, as they come to you today in Jesus' name. If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer loud with me right where you're seated, loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. Would you pray this with me, church? Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe he's Lord of all. So today, I believe that with my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. And thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord. Go ahead.